The great thing about this story, and that's why I don't think I'll ever do this kind of book ever again, it was like walking into a 19th century novel. It was like living a novel. You know, a Balzac novel. You know, about the, the you know, Voltrine and the invested and, yeah. and, and also, but also crime and punishment, that kind of, ah, uh, there was just such haunted characters in the case, and also such noble characters. I mean, the most evil people I've ever known, that journalist from Spain, the corrupt journalist, this, this Frenchman. Uh, Who had a totally different view from yours. What they were kind of, yeah, unwittingly <laughs> or not, they were pumping misinformation out yeah. there, you know, and, and uh, being manipulated by Guatemalan military intelligence. And, uh, um, you know, it might have been unwitting, I don't know. You know, and, and, and obviously the Limas, these, these, these narco military men, to all of a sudden have them leaving messages on my phone in Brooklyn, it was crazy. It was an immersion in a very dark, violent world. And there were times when it would take you over. You would just feel like you're in this battle, you know, and you're my enemy, and you're fixated. And, and I would feel so bad because I was in this marriage, and my wife was like, this, she, this was not a part of her life at all. She didn't know anything about it. I didn't want her to know anything about it. And I would feel cut off sometimes. Because here I am plunged into this darkness, and you're doing your outer kinds of things, you know. And I used to be very hard. And uh, I said to her, my big worry was they, they would know that if they really wanted to harm me, they would do something to her. And that's how they operate. And I said to her, we went to Guatemala, and she was, oh, I love it here. Let's come back next summer and rent a, a house on the beach, on the lake. And I said, I want to take a good look around because you are never coming back here. <laughs> you know, once this book is out, you are never coming back here. You know, and not only that, we're not going back to Mexico next summer because I think they can find us in Mexico if they want to. So we're going to France for the summer. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of the book. I know it's nonfiction, um, but um, it's, I kind of had the feeling while reading through the book, um, you give so many details as well. You give details about the weather, for example, uh, or how people looked like, how you felt, very personal um, information. Um, where do you actually place yourself um, between fiction and non-fiction? Well, I, I mean, I think this book is, is written the way it is because I'm a fiction writer. And so I understand that the art of fiction is to create a to create an illusory reality out of words, out of details, out of convincing human gestures that people read and believe and think that that's real. And for a nonfiction book to have maximum authority, to really make the reader believe, you know, um, you have to employ the same arts as a novelist. And then I realized that that's really what a great prosecutor does in some ways. I mean, the prosecutor is a different end than the novelist, but he still has to assemble a narration. And that narration is based out of human gestures. Why did they do it? What did they do? And the evidence, concrete details, that proves that they really did do that. And so I was fascinated by that similarity, you know, building a case. I think that's why novelists love often, you know, great detectives and, and, and really smart prosecutors because and there's, some, and we're, there's a lot that's, that's kindred in what we do. We're assembling narratives, narrators that rely so much on our ability to seem credible. I was wondering when I read through the book and you meet all those really corrupt and violent people, um, has it somehow shaped your view on humanity as well? In terms of trusting people, for example? Um, it taught me what, what real evil is. You know, I still, you know, the United States is often such a, and probably England, it's just such a relativistic culture. There's not real evil. There's just people who make mistakes. 
their upbringing, and, you know, whatever, you know. No, they're really bad people, you know, who rejoice in causing suffering or are motivated by just pure greed and ideological fanaticism. I don't say to say he's a killer because he's an ideological fanatic. I don't think that excuses him. I think it's a form of evil, you know. And so, and I just in case of people like Captain Lima and some of the other people in that case, even certain journalists, you felt a kind of, in Spanish, maldad, I don't know what the English language would be, a real love of evil. No? Almost satanic. Because evil is, evil is a form of beauty. Right? Evil, evil, is, evil is a form of beauty devoid of the moral content that we're used to applying to the word beauty. But it has form. It has coherence. It has weight. It has a sheen. And you can see why people become addicted to it. And the score they have for people who aren't as Machiavellian as they are, who seem just sentimental, aren't as realistic as they are, aren't as self-fulfilled as they are, real killers, real criminals, you know? And, 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 and this case really puts you in touch with that, that, he, that horrible side of the spirit. But it also puts you in touch with every other kind of person. And I mean the full rainbow. You know, f f uh, from the most wicked to someone like Claudia Mendes, the young journalist who believes in God. She's an angel. Finally, Francisco, do you want to tell me something about your current future projects? Well, as you know, uh, I'm finishing a book now. Uh, you know, about the death of my wife. My wife died the summer after, the summer, right, the summer, like two months before this book came out, in a swimming accident in Mexico that, that uh, blew my life to pieces, and my life is still blown to pieces. And I've been writing about the book, certainly not as therapy, because it's not therapeutic, more just because, and again, this happened to me, and I'm a writer, and my only way of processing things, my only way of responding to things is to process them into writing. And, and, and uh, I, I'm about to finish this book. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do after. I do know that the Bishop Harari case and writing about the death of my wife, Aura, and living through the two have changed me forever. I'm not the person who wrote those earlier books. Um, I don't know what it's going to mean. I think I'm a more inward person now than I was before. I think um, I have a sense of the reality of human suffering that I didn't have before. Now that I've, to be frank, you know, suffered so much myself, and, and I, it makes me feel closer. It makes me gives me a loyalty in a sense that somehow, you know, I have to uh, be close to that. You know, and 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 and, and what it's going to turn into in future writing, I, I really feel like I'm starting over. I have no idea. We will wait. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. The more I read the art of political murder, the more I felt as if I was reading crime fiction. With a very strong narrative, Francisco provides us with his personal and very vivid observations on the case. I get the sense that as a storyteller, he lets us participate in the most unlikely legal victory and the most unexpected triumph of Guatemalan history. Thanks for watching, I've been Yenak von for World TV.